before I present my paper, I'd like uh, to join others in paying homage to Arantink, and there's no need to say more about him. But I would like to pay homage to a colleague and a friend who passed away just uh, a week or ten days ago, Wafa Gulizade, uh, who had a major input in transforming a shaky ceasefire into a permanent one in the War of Garabakh. That story has not been written. I hope it will be part of my next book. My presentation will approach the themes we have been discussing from a different angle, that is, from inside out. The impact of genocide on Armenian political thinking and the way it appears in the foreign policy of independent Armenia and its strategic implications. In other words, the instrumentalization of genocide. I will leave aside the discussion of the diaspora. The Ottoman Empire and Turkey have been at the core of Armenian attitudes for a long time, but especially since World War I. With or without recognition, with or without direct references, affairs of state, public opinion, and scholarship have been formulated with reference to what is, uh, to what is one to think of the Turk, and that has a lot to do with Armenia's independence or the impossibility thereof. In simple terms, though I hope not simplistically, here is the question. Are the Turk and Turkey genocidal in their essence? Or is what happened in 1915 explained by historical circumstances as a historical event or process? If the answer to this question in substance is yes, that the Turk and Turkey are genocidal, then Armenia cannot be an independent state. It must always rely on Russia for its protection, and Russia is more than happy to indulge and extract a price. The price for security in this case would be the loss of sovereignty and, and the imposition of whatever regime is convenient to Moscow in Armenia. In this case, if the Turks and Turkey are genocidal in essence, Armenians, uh, Armenia cannot have and does not need a foreign and security policy. They're not actors in the making of their own future. Uh, they just need to make sure that Russians love them. Armenia and Armenians, therefore, cannot have a history. At best, they will have a martyrology. If the answer to the first question is negative, that we are dealing with history and historical processes, then uh, if we do not proceed as if Turkey was a genocidal state, then Armenia has a chance for independence, independent statehood, um, and then what Armenians say and do, do matter. In 19, just as a quick background, in 1980, there had evolved a consensus in the diaspora, despite battles before, uh, that Soviet Armenia is okay. It is secure. Um, uh, so we're not independent. Well, there are issues with human and political rights, but it's okay because we are secure. So uh, the diaspora came basically to agree uh, with the regime in Armenia of the Soviet statehood. And uh, historiography, even in the diaspora, but certainly in uh, Soviet Armenia, uh, emphasized the Russian orientation as a natural thing for Armenians to follow because it provides for security. And uh, I think this was also a way for the communist regime that had lost its legitimacy to legitimize itself by following the nationalist uh, line or a national history line, emphasizing uh, genocide and indirectly saying that you guys shouldn't think about independence. The Garapal movement, although started on the question of Garapal uh, at the time evolved very quickly because of Soviet behavior and because of other pressures, it evolved into a major program, uh, a movement for a national revival and eventually independence. In this debate, and there were, this issue was debated in the Supreme Soviet of yet to be independent Armenia, and these two issues were presented. There were even diaspora representatives who were invited to address, and some parties and the Communist Party argued that Armenia cannot be independent because there's Turkey. 
and we need to stay within the Soviet Union. Otherwise, if we are independent, we're not part of Russia or the Soviet Union, they will come and exterminate us, the rest of us. By some miracle, it is the second uh, policy that won in Armenia in 1990-91. That is, we can be independent and we can deal with Turkey state to state and have normalized relations. Incidentally, I should say here that the border uh, between the two countries was not closed in 1993. It was closed during the Soviet period. It was the Iron Curtain, remember? There was only one train for decades that came from Moscow to what is Gimbri now, then Leninagan, crossed the Turkish border, and then was there. It, it, two cars, I took that in 1975, once a week, Wednesday noons. That was it. It came, dropped people off, didn't take anyone, and came back. Um, so uh, the border had been closed. It never opened to be closed in 93. Now, at our request, uh, in 92, Turkey opened the border to bring in Euro uh, European donated wheat, which couldn't come by trains from, uh, uh, because of the Abkhaz conflict. So uh, I'll talk about that a little later. But also they opened it for special individuals. I crossed that border three times to go to Ankara for negotiations. Now, we've had three administrations, three different presidents in Armenia, Uh, three administrations. Watch. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I have these suspicious looks at when people look at that. <laughs> three administrations. The first uh, was the Derbedrosan administration. In terms of uh, relations with Turkey, it was a very simple proposition. That is, we normalize relations and uh, open the border without any preconditions. The genocide issue was not a matter of state policy. It was a matter of commemoration. It was a matter of history. It was a, mat a matter of a museum and uh, dignified uh, processions, but it did not constitute the basis of Armenia's foreign policy or certainly for the bilateral relations. The issue was not discussed, at least not on our part. It was raised sometimes informally when we had too much rocker with the Turkish colleagues, they might raise, aren't you going to talk about this thing called genocide? And I'd say that there's no such thing, a thing called genocide. There is a genocide, but I'm not talking about it. You want to talk about it? Go ahead. Not, not I. Uh, so anyway, the, um, it was a simple proposition. And as Kemal indicated, in 93 February, we were very close to having a protocol normalize and open the border. But the operations in, on the Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict uh, became too, uh, too much of an issue, and Turkey stopped these negotiations. We continued talking. We, uh, since then, bilateral uh, relations have been linked to the Garapal issue. So the genocide issue was not there as far as a matter of bilateral uh, negotiations. In the second administration under Kocharyan, it became uh, part of public discourse by the president himself and by others in the Armenian government. And this was not because there was too much uh, uh, significance given to genocide in and by itself, uh, not on the part of Kocharyan, although the argument had been continuing against the first administration that the n denial or non-recognition of genocide by Turkey is a matter of national security, that means Turkey will do it again. So it was perceived not only as a matter of what had happened in the past, but as current imminent danger and possible future uh, policy on the part of Turkey. Kocharyan didn't care about that argument. Kocharyan wanted the border open. What he cared about uh, was, look, uh, Turkey has linked Garapal as a precondition, pro progress or resolution of the Garapal conflict, precondition for bilateral. Uh, why don't we raise the genocide issue? We'll scare them. Uh, we'll get the Turks to, uh, to be scared, 
and, and then uh, uh, they will withdraw. If Armenia goes behind the campaign for recognition, then Turks, Turkey will be uh, scared and they will uh, withdraw their linkage to Garapagh, their precondition. Of course, none of that happened. So the genocide became a bargaining chip with Turkey. The third administration, today's administration, has been the most unpredictable. Uh, we know that the, the protocols were signed. I think Nigar will talk more about that. I will not go into it. And the, here in these protocols, there were two issues that were ostensibly resolved without being resolved. Well, one is, uh, do you talk since Kocharyan and Sarkisyan had talked about genocide, the Turks said, well, there must be something about that in the protocol. There was nothing about that in the protocol we had drafted. But in, because it became part of public discourse, state-level uh, continuation uh, uh, insistence on talking about genocide, although not still as a precondition, uh, then the protocols in uh, 2009, was it? 2009, uh, had a subcommittee created, or it would be created, to study, to find the truth about history. And everyone assumed we're talking about genocide. Uh, and the Garapal issue was not mentioned, although uh, the principle that uh, the signatories to the protocols do not intervene in the affairs of other states uh, would have been an indirect reference. Now, um, it's interesting that having talked to both Armenian and Turkish officials at the time, uh, neither Armenia nor Turkey had any plans for the subcommission. They had no visualization of what a subcommission would look like. Mandate, budget, duration, what questions to be asked, etc. Now, and then since then, uh, when Armenia thought Turkey was, had already uh, delinked bilateral, uh, then Prime Minister Erdogan said, you know, uh, these will not be implemented until the Garapar issue is resolved or there's progress in that. And then, since then, things have gotten uh, not so, uh, uh, not in the right direction. There was football diplomacy. I will not go into that. And then suddenly, in September, on September 3 last year, uh, President Saxian of Armenia in Moscow uh, basically declared that Armenia would join the Eurasian Economic Union, which means scrapping four years of negotiations with Europe as an associated state. Then came uh, last month or two months ago the uh, Pan-Armenian, so-called Pan-Armenian Declaration of the uh, Armenian Commission for the 100th Anniversary Commemoration of the Genocide, which uh, re referred to a, something like historic justice, the Sever Treaty, Wilsonian borders, and then, you know, that's already a very different ballgame than just recognition of the genocide. And then because that created some problems, Serge Sarkisyan, the president of Armenia, said Armenia has no, has never had territorial claims. Although for many of the signatories, uh, they declared, they, they considered that commission statement chaired by the pres same president um, as um, as uh, the basis for demands. And more recently, the Parliament of Armenia uh, referred to that positively, to that same Pan-Armenian declaration. Then Sir Saxian said, uh, you know, we, don't, we can do without that border. It's not essential to us, the opening of the border. We can survive. Now, there are items in the past 20 years that have, uh, and before that have complicated this uh, situation. One is, uh, the Sumgait issue in 1998, end of February, 1988, February, uh, the uh, pogroms against Armenians in uh, the city of Sumgait, Sumgait near. And that is significant for a couple of reasons. One, Armenians, especially in Garapag, refer to Azerbaijanis as Turks. There's an equation there that the, these two are not that different. And there are many statements on both sides that indicate that they, they're at least cousins, if not brothers. Uh, 
so the Turk did it. And I know that the reaction from the government in Armenia was, not again, never again. We can't allow this thing to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, so this was, uh, that is uh, not the government, but the opposition. Uh, and this was very important in the evolution of the national movement from strictly a Garapag matter to a national agenda matter. That is, if we were part of the Soviet Union for security, where was the Soviet Union when our people were being killed in Sumgait? So the, the connection became a very important thing, and it's become worse since then, and that makes it uh, very difficult, to, makes it more difficult to resolve the Garapak problem because if you see it as a Turkish problem, then, uh, then it's a different uh, sort of animal. Azerbaijan has joined in with Turkey on the uh, denial process. You know, despite early uh, uh, resistance to that, eventually uh, I assume that Turkey demanded that Azerbaijan be, uh, join the campaign uh, for denial. Now, then there's the rhetoric, uh, the Turkish rhetoric of power, um, and, uh, and then there's um, the other side. That is, what are the things that have happened to, to facilitate uh, that may be considered, uh, and that is um, 1992-93, Turkey opened its rail lines to supply wheat from Europe, but to supply uh, the wheat, uh, to transport the wheat to Armenia, without which Armenia, in the worst winter of the whole period, uh, might have starved. So this indicated something that the Turks are not there to kill you. If they wanted to kill you, all they needed to say is, no, we're not giving you our rail lines. But this, despite the fact that I repeat it, has never come into Armenian political discourse because it counters the, the uh, other narrative. Uh, the Turkey has opened, uh, opened the rail lines, which it closed because of Garapa. Uh, Turkey opened the charter flights between Istanbul and Yerevan. Uh, that, that is very important. It has facilitated visa issues. Um, it has uh, not prohibited indirect trade through Georgia usually. Uh, and uh, the large number of Armenians from Armenia who work in Turkey are still uh, okay. Uh, Turkey no longer uh, prosecutes people who use the term genocide. There's a significant number of, uh, still a minority, but a significant number of historians, Turkish and uh, 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 from Turkey, uh, students who study this issue, and books that are published. There are some churches that have been renovated. There's a different attitude and... and um, uh, Tom referred to some of them. Uh, the statements by the Prime Minister and, and President on, on April 23, April 24, uh, are certainly not satisfactory, but the fact that they did make a statement, I, I think, is significant. Now, well, where are we now? Um, Putin one is, was in Yerevan on April 24th, and um, it made the Turks upset. And it, um, but then the next day he called Turkey a strategic partner. So um, that complicates things, but, uh, you know, we will, if we want to, we can disregard all of that. Putin is still our, our man. Um, what Putin is saying is, um, look, um, it's a good thing you have the April 24th. Don't ever forget the genocide. Don't ever forget the character of the Turk, although they are our strategic partners. But for you, they're a threat. And so uh, don't think about uh, resisting our attempts in the South Caucasus. And, uh, you know, we will provide you the security, security regarding Turkey, uh, as long as you give up whatever we want you to give up. Uh, and that process is continuing. That is, there has been a the more importance given to genocide on the state level in Armenia, the more sovereignty we've given to 
uh, to, uh, to Moscow. Um, then time's up. Uh, oh, no, no, it isn't. <laughs> That's your watch. <laughs> we don't trust it anyway, right? <laughs> well, uh, let, let me uh, then cut it short, um, getting to the interesting part. Um, uh, in 1996, um, April, uh, I think I did my last official visit to Ankara. Mesut Yilmaz was the prime minister. And I had a long meeting with him. And I presented him with the following issue. Armenia is no longer at the stage where we don't have energy, we don't have wheat. We're now thinking of the next 10, 20 years. And we're thinking about long-term security and we are wondering whether Turkey will be part of the problem of Armenia's security or part of its solution. Because the security, if the threat is from Turkey, then we need Russia. The more threat we create or we imagine, the more uh, we will give in to Russia. But if, Ru if Turkey is not a security threat or a minor one, then we, we have more independence. He understood that. Uh, but then he was sabotaged by Baku because he wanted to open the border. The next week he went to Baku to say he wanted to open the border to inform President Aliyev, and that was sabotaged in Baku. Now, uh, where are we now? We don't... Uh, the centennial has aggravated uh, dispositions in Ankara uh, for, on the part of the government. Uh, the Armenian discourse has gone mainly on genocide. Uh, so many interviews now on the Turkish threat in Yerevan. Um, and we have, um, at the same time, uh, this issue kind of hiding what is happening in terms of Armenia's sovereignty. Complicating two things. One, the genocide centennial has been used uh, to uh, then ignore what's happening, to avoid a serious discussion on relations with Russia and sovereignty. And secondly, it is being used to legitimize a government that is seen largely as illegitimate. If I'm talking about genocide, then I'm a good government. And that has nothing to do with democracy has nothing to do with human rights. And this is a very dangerous thing. On the Turkish side, there has been a retrenchment. The terms that uh, uh, Tom used uh, are not used in writing, in human treatment. They haven't come out. It was Davutoglu on a plane uh, that mentioned it, but it is not in their statement uh, in human treatment or whatever. And um, uh, they have elections too. So my conclusion is, that we are in the worst situation we have been in a long time in terms of this issue, and maybe we should uh, uh, stop for a moment, uh, get back, and once the dust settles on, on the centennial and the elections and uh, part of future, uh, and then maybe there should be a serious study of what are the points of conjunction, what has happened are there things on which we agree? What are the things on which we disagree? And what can be the possible solutions, not by government representatives, but by a group of intellectual scholars who know this issue, and to kind of lay the groundwork uh, for the future, which we hope will come. Thank you. Thank you.